Maggie Crowley received her MFA from the University of Chicago in 2013, her MA from Eastern Illinois University in 2011, and her BS from Illinois State University in 2009. Crowley has exhibited in numerous venues, including the Riva David Logan Center for the Arts, the Evanston Art Center, the Hyde Park Art Center, Area Lugar de Proyectos in Caguas, Puerto Rico, and uh, 65 Grand in Chicago. Her work has been featured in the prestigious Norm Journal, New American Paintings in 2017 and 2013. Since 2014, Crowley has co-directed Produce Model Gallery in the Pilsen neighborhood of Chicago. The gallery is dedicated to programming and exhibitions featuring Caribbean and Latinx artists. Crowley serves on the board of the International Children's Media Center in Chicago, helping, helping to facilitate education programs for prisons, jails, and at-risk students in Chicago. Hi everybody, welcome to the Hyde Park Art Center's Center Sunday. My name is Mariela Cunha and I am the Exhibitions and Residency Coordinator here at the Hyde Park Art Center. And I am really excited to be joined by Maggie Crowley today. Uh, Maggie, uh, Maggie's exhibition just opened very recently um, and it is on view until June 6th. So if you have not had a chance to see it, please come. Um, you can make a reservation through our website and it is a show that you don't want to miss. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Mariela. Um, thank you for having me for this program. It's really exciting to be here and to be talking about the work. Um, the show has been a little bit of a long time coming. It was delayed, postponed, um, like the rest of the world because of the pandemic. Um, which was kind of hard to manage in the studio, but also a really great thing because it gave me time to think about the work in a totally different way. Um, when Allison Peters Quinn and I originally started talking about this exhibition, I was in my studio making work um, kind of related to, to things that I was setting up myself and kind of responding to. And the pandemic forced me to kind of get out into my neighborhood, look at my community. Um, and so that's really kind of where this work started. And I've always been interested in kind of the figure and the figure working, the figure in motion. Um, my mom is a hairdresser and I grew up in her hair salon, which is like a super busy environment. Um, lots of talking, lots of energy, lots of movement. And that's kind of my uh, first experience with form and with the figure and observation. Uh, and so at the beginning of the pandemic, well, right before the pandemic, in thinking about this show, I actually went and did um, what I call a looking residency mm -hmm. at her hair salon, observing mm -hmm. her and her clients, uh, and also the small town that I'm from, just kind of like really spending time there with no um, major plans, just kind of seeing what there was to see. And when I took my notes and my sketches and my photos from that experience back to my studio, it felt sort of inadequate to render imagery directly from that. And I wanted to find ways to kind of talk about the symbols and the textures of work instead of pointing at them directly. Um, so a lot of this work you see, I call them textures, but it's, it's uh, surfaces and, and pattern and objects that relate to the working class and relate to labor um, personally, but also I think on a cultural level too. <laughs> cool, and so a lot of that um, imagery that you're talking about shows up in the work, I think. Yeah, totally. It's painting you, no? Yeah, exactly. And this, the the most um, obvious in this work is the checkered pattern. Mm -hmm. And my mom's hair salon had black and white check floors, which was, it's, it's like really stuck in my mind, this sort of um, pattern. And I associate it with like the work day, you know what I mean? Like 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and I was a shampoo girl and I swept the mm -hmm. floors and so like I had a relationship with this space. 
And it's something I do a lot, this check patterning to kind of think through ideas and also think about resolving compositions. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is I've always associated checkers with my great grandpa, because that is his name. He was my Aww. grandpa checkers. And he was um, very much, you know, associated with the working class. He was a bartender. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of like, you wouldn't need to know that to, to have entry into the work, but it's there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yeah. I appreciate that you can talk about the work on like a personal level and as it relates to your family and as, as those relationships show up in the work, but also in a kind of macro way right. and talk about issues of labor and, and the complexities of labor as it relates to identity and uh, race and the relationship that each individual has with their own work. Totally. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think for me to labor, when I think about labor, when I read about it, Noam Chomsky talks a lot about how talks a lot about how the majority of the world works. Everyone needs to make a living, and so labor is really central to movements to, to most movements. And in the United States, the we associate the labor movement kind of with like the construction worker, the white blue collar male, um, and the real truth is that workers around the world are people of color. They're diverse in gender, sexuality, their immigration status. And so I'm interested in kind of flipping the archetype and looking at it in a more critical sense. And when I think of my first, when I first started having like a, a, a deeper understanding of that um, contradiction, I am from a small farm town. And so I had this idea of farming um, it's like my friend's grandpa's and it's like generational and it's soybeans and corn and like that's sort of it And then I went to college and I went to state school in the Corn Belt and I took an agriculture class And I learned about Cesar Chavez which like exploded my understanding of migrant workers um, pesticides activism all of the things how agriculture is like you know determines the supply chain so kind of just like understanding the complexities of labor and how it relates to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing that I want to ask you is, um, so, so I think a lot of the work um, in the show relates to labor and also visibility and visibility of labor. And I um, just want you to talk a little bit more about uh, that and how it shows up in the work because I see it as it relates to the materials that you're working with totally. as well as uh, subject matter and what you're right. thinking. I think too visibility for me starts um, kind of in questioning that notion. Visibility is also representation and it's also accountability and I, I started thinking about it because most essential workers wear um, safety apparel that's high visibility. Mm -hmm. And in doing just like a little bit of research mm -hmm. about that, it's, I learned that it's, the high visibility material was made specifically to give workers peace of mind. So if you're working a dangerous job, if you're on a highway directing traffic, high visibility apparel um, kind of is also working. It's telling other people around you where you are to look out for you. So that nonverbal communication is really interesting to me. And with some of the works in the show, especially the garments, when you take a high visibility garment and you remove the, its visibility, it becomes really strange and confusing. Mm -hmm. And I sort of wanted to confront the viewer with what it means to take the most essential information out of a form. Like, mm -hmm. does it become something else? Does it become less important? Um, and I think this question of visibility uh, with the working class and with labor is that we, we don't see it culturally and societally. It's like you don't think about the um, kind of the invisible systems of buildings, of neighborhoods, of 
corporations, the things that kind of determine how everything runs. If that makes sense. That makes sense. And I'm thinking about how you just said um, when you remove the kind of high visibility to of something like a safety vest. Um, and it's interesting to think about that in relation to your paintings of the safety vests and, and the right. surface that they're on because um, sometimes the surface kind of becomes more visible than the totally. paint itself because of how the paint sits right. on it. Um, right. Could you talk a little bit yeah. more about that and the material? Yeah, so I started um, photographing and drawing from life just workers in my neighborhood and because it was safe to do during the pandemic, it's like you can stand at a distance and observe someone as opposed to like having a model or working any other way. And I love neon pigment and from a painting point of view, <laughs> it's like a little bit contradictory to the history of painting, but I love the plastic. Um, it's just like so abrasive and so in your face and I <laughs> like that. And so I made a bunch of, um, paintings of these like cropped viewpoints of the workers and then like three months later and I lived with them and I, I like had studio visits and I would think about them and then after about like three months I just really wanted to erase the neon and so there's some most of the the neon vest vests that are painted in the show have been painted over to kind of like subdue or erase the neon. It's still under there and it still shows through. Um, but I just kept thinking about the invisible garments. And so it's like I made, I had sewn those and that was very satisfying. And the way I thought about it made a lot of sense and I wanted the paintings to feel the same way. So the, the, the vests that are painted have tons of layers of paint. And I think sometimes you can see through the different layers, which is, which is nice. Um, but then with the silk, some of the silk behaves like high reflective material mm -hmm. because the warp is one color and the weft is another. Mm -hmm. And so depending on how you look at the silk, it, it is almost reflective. Mm -hmm. And so those, the material of the, the painted image kind of mimicking the material it's painted on is just a really nice, um, experience, I think. It's yeah. something that interested me in, in trying to finish the work. Yeah, and it looks really good. So people <laughs> should come see it. Um, great. What about, so I guess, staying with this question of visibility, um, and, and you, you mentioned, right, this kind of new language that we have around essential workers now totally. since the pandemic started. I'm wondering if that, um, kind of shift in how we think about mm -hmm. labor or kind of, I mean, right. a slight shift. I don't even know if we can call it a shift, but right. at least it's, it's kind of maybe conscious, conscious right. building. Um, right. has, has that affected how you think about this? Is Because a lot of this work is work that you were doing before the pandemic. Totally. Right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it was, it's like, it's, when the pandemic was kind of like just starting and people were still clapping for healthcare workers, mm -hmm. there was a part of me, I mean, that it's almost like cringy that we're just now starting to applaud these people who've always been doing this job. Now it's under a microscope and it's like under these, um, the framework of a pandemic, which is really scary and uncertain. Um, but I, I felt like sometimes uncomfortable with how we heroicized that work. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the thing I've thought about a lot with essential workers is kind of just that word essential is identifying them that way. Because um, I think there's so much more than that and I think probably everyone would argue that their job is essential. And so it's like when we start creating this hierarchy, um, then other kind of weird insidious things start happening where we label work as unskilled or low skilled or high stakes or low stakes and mm -hmm. and I'm just it's just a curious thing that um, I feel like needs more critical observation. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I was also really excited at the beginning of the pandemic when these conversations were happening about what could 
come out of right. it. And then, yeah, I'm not it, sure. It's I, a, I'm not sure yeah. it has kind of right. gone farther. Right. It's such a good point. And now I was just reading recently that like Amazon workers are trying to unionize after I think they've attempted a few times and it's been unsuccessful. But um, yeah, it's like we we were like cheering for the mailman and we like are boycotting Amazon. But Amazon is literally a million essential workers in this country, and it's like yeah. these things become very at odds, and and it's it's really about the bigger systems in the background. Again, kind of pointing at visibility. It's the real change and like policy policy reform would have to do with like the bigger entities that are controlling things behind the scenes, mm -hmm. not the workers, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a big question. I mean, in relation to any work that is about these large issues that affect life, right? And, right. And, totally. And um, and what the voice of an artist, yeah, totally uh, brings to the conversation. Right. 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 It's like an exciting challenge. And, yeah. You know, um, a big question too. Yeah. Um. Another thing that I really love about your work and that is really visible in this work actually, so I'm glad uh, people will see it, is um, that you usually work on unstretched mm -hmm. fabric and that you can kind of pick it up and go and that uh, whenever the work needs to grow, you're able to just kind of sew another piece together. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I, I think it relates to the content of the work and what we've been talking about, how, how people work and, and the kind of flexibility totally. that it gives you to, right. um, um, do you see it as related to? Yeah, I think flexibility is like the perfect word for it because I, I just read this thing recently um, where Dr. Maya, Dr. Maya Angelou talks about when she used to have parties. Um, the people in her home that she would invite and the things they would talk about, their words were things that got into her curtains and her furniture and her carpet. And, and that's how important they are. And that's how we should like consider our words and the things we surround ourselves with and the people we surround ourselves with. But I think about that, like everywhere the work goes, like in my studio, in my home, in a place like the Hyde Park Art Center, it's absorbing that community and that um, the energy of those spaces. And I like that the work, that the paintings are working. You know, that is kind of their labor to be receptacles for different environments in that way. Um, another thing that I'm like super fascinated with the silk is that it's the labor of an insect. It really is kind of this other biological work that's happening. And I'm always like digging through textile warehouses, um, looking for pure silk. There's an awesome one in my neighborhood on 21st Street. And um, talking to the employees there, they're like, it's really hard to find pure silk now. Um, there's a few different kinds and there's, it's, there's people have different preferences for different kinds of silk and the Shantung silk that I use usually has two different colors, like I was saying earlier, but it also sometimes has like a tooth, and that's determined by the diet of the worm, which is like so fascinating to yeah. me, and it's kind of like all these different life cycles are going on at once um, to kind of make a painting. I don't know. I really like that idea. It's like we're all working together. We're working like with nature and everything, which is really nice. Um, I'm trying to think of something else you just said that I wanted to touch on. Is it the piecing it together oh, yeah. part of it? Exactly. So um, I think being able to piece it together just logistically enables some of the work to be site specific, which is, I think, could be generous for different kinds of institutions. I like that flexibility. I like that it's adaptable. It's mm -hmm. like it could. Fit. It's not fussy. It's not like too um, like held down by by like architectural uh, constraints or qualities. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It kind of responds to it instead of having instead of the other way around. Um, 
also the way I paint with the gouache, I have to work on a tabletop and on the wall, mm -hmm. so I have to move the work up mm -hmm. and down a lot. And it's just easier when it's not on a stretcher. It's just easier to have it loose, um, to be able to, to move it around and keep it really lightweight. I have two questions related to that. Is uh, one is, does the work grow as it goes, or um, do you start with the? I usually work from life or an image, and honestly, I usually cut it up, and then like the one part that I'm really responding to informs how I build from there. So for this piece, I was. Um, in southern Illinois in a town called Anna, Illinois, and I got a flat tire. Mm -hmm. And I went to this tire shop that was like basically a tire museum. It was the most incredible mechanic tire <laughs> shop I've ever been to. And um, the image is upside down right here, but the person who owned the shop had the tires like on display. They looked like sculptures. It looked like just it was really unbelievable. And so I was really drawn to that experience of him making his shop so perfect and so beautiful yeah. and like presenting it to the, to the town. Um, but there were parts of the composition that I felt like were unresolved and it needed, it's like, I think the, the floor of that tire shop was like too geometric and I needed something to kind of break up the plane and make it look a little stranger and less recognizable. And so building up around it mm -hmm. um, is kind of like always my solution. It's like I tear it down and then build it back up, sort of. The boot was um, a full-size painting. I actually had a Pam Anderson of the era when she was on um, Home Improvement and like the assistant to the tool guy <laughs> on the show, it's like this, Again, like really playing into that um, archetype of the worker and like the ruggedness and all of that. So yeah, and, and the check pattern was sort of just my way of tying it all together at the end. And then the decision to hang it, do you usually hang your work? So most of the work that's not stretched or on like traditional canvas, I do prefer to suspend it. I see them as room dividers or ways mm -hmm. of navigating space. Um, so this is definitely the front. They have a frontedness, mm -hmm. but they can be viewed in the round, which is kind of nice. Suspending them is important. Um, I like the idea of them playing between objecthood and painting, kind of existing between 2D and 3D and being a little bit more experiential. They're also less precious when you suspend them. When they're mm -hmm. not flat up against a wall, um, they're more inviting to the viewer. And so I like that kind of casualness too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like seeing you touch them. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't touch them, but I like seeing you kind of handle them. <laughs> I do get that vibe. Cool. You know? yeah. cool. So the title of the show is Playmate, which comes directly from the igloo coolers, which are used by construction workers to take their lunch to work. Um, my dad takes an igloo playmate cooler to work and he has my whole life. And it's this object that for me has um, existed in the background of my mind, but also punctuated my understanding of the work day, of um, kind of personal objects, personal items people have. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a object that's easy to disregard. It's kind of a throwaway object, but I have started to see it really as this sort of beloved, um, sort of sacred item. Um, and I think that those personal narratives pop up throughout the show. Yeah. Um, there's a piece in the hallway that is of a wrapped gift and I really, I, love, it. I really <laughs> love that painting because it's, I was painting from life a gift that I wrapped and, and I painted it and then when I was done and I wrapped it around the stretcher bars, it was like performing the exact same labor, which was really, just felt very complimentary. 
And also when I was making it, um, I, the last few years around the holidays, I will take photos of presents before I give them to people. And I've, I don't really know why it was always like a curious thing. And I would like look at the photo on my phone and kind of like wonder about it. And it was just this year that I brought the gift to my studio and I was like, I'm going to just paint this. And when I was painting it, I was like really taken back to this experience I had as a kid watching my aunt who was a um, seasonal gift wrapper at the mall. And so I was like totally taken back to maybe one of my first experiences with form in, and with like decoration and beauty and how to make something look a certain way. Um, and I've always loved that labor of gift wrapping and, and sort of its relationship to the holidays and family and social calendars and all of that. And it's, it's also just really cool. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever seen a gift get wrapped like I in a love Macy's. Wrapping gifts. Oh my gosh. It's also just like their scissors are so sharp and it the fold. Goes so smooth. Yes. It's, it's so just great. like so satisfying and beautiful and um so it felt very like we were singing the same song or something, making the painting and thinking about kind of that memory of my aunt, which was really nice. <laughs> we haven't talked a lot about the Kind of more sculptural uh, oh, yeah. pieces. Sure. Do you want to tell us about them? I don't know much sure. about them. Sure. Yeah. So I started um, in painting the safety vests and the safety apparel, really just in an attempt to understand them even more. I wanted to work in different mediums. Um, that was just like one approach of, of understanding them more. And so the transparent silk was obvious to me because it's it's void of all pigment and it's kind of like an interesting problem to have in trying to build something. So in painting the safety vest so much and wanting to understand them more, just doing material studies helped me think through different iterations. Um, and the silk garments, it was an obvious choice for me to use transparent silk because it's void of that like essential key information, which is mm -hmm. the high visibility pigment. Um, and then with the plaster piece, I actually remade a safety vest out of a really thick starchy, <coughs> starchy material because I wanted to emphasize the lines of the um, reflective material. And in safety apparel, the like square inches, the amount of reflective material is how it's classified by like OSHA and safety departments. And I wanted to like really focus in on those, those lines. Um, and so I made the garment and it still felt kind of weird. And then I wanted to cast it. And <laughs> um, I'm not a sculptor. <laughs> I like this process of like doing this thing and then feeling the need to and do this other thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and so the, the cast, I also chose plaster because again, there's no color. It's kind of like completely blank, completely empty. Um, and in the language of the safety apparel, it's like not doing its job when it doesn't have any need. So the plaster was obvious. And then after I pulled that cast, it looked very dirty and muddy. And most of the um, safety gear that I pull my imagery from is that way. It is like someone's wearing it on a job or it's um, shut in the window of a truck, like letting people know that it's a construction site. And so I wanted to mimic those conditions a little bit. The title of this piece is Fell Off a Truck, which is an expression used to talk about um, stealing something or mm -hmm. obtaining something through taking it. I had no idea. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So I, I wanted it to look um, discarded or forgotten mm -hmm. or picked up somewhere kind of randomly. This idea that you've talked a little bit about, um, of um, kind of negotiating what information to leave, what information to take away. Um, 
you talked about it in terms of like color and visibility, but I feel like it's also I also see it in the way you paint. Mm -hmm. um, there is the painting of the Rugrats uh, right. ga gowns, the scrubs, vendors, yeah, yeah um, where that is is so visible too, right. you know. Um, so it feels like it's part of how you work and the negotiation right. that happens all mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. um, in your studio. Yeah, that painting, the information in the background and the information unique to the figure is less mm -hmm. important. It's really about the printed um, patterning on that scrub uniform. Yeah, it's just <laughs> kind of just enough to recognize it, right. which is really nice. Right, yeah. Studs Terkel wrote about the relationship between work and faith, and that's something that I'm constantly trying to understand. Working is peace of mind, a way of constantly searching for meaning and establishing presence. I hope people enjoy a long, slow look. Some of the silk is two-toned and changes colors from different angles. In this moment we're in, the pandemic has heroicized essential workers, but oftentimes these kinds of jobs are really demanding and full of uncertainty. I hope people reconsider how we label work after they see the show.